Carroll from when my mother lived at Exeter House and then at Fred Lynn Manor and um, was just uh, Exeter House. I loved it. And I have always said, and my children loved it too. And so I've always said, if it still existed, I would be signing myself up for Exeter House fairly soon. <laughs> But, uh, but that's how I got to speak to you today because of Carol. And so I'm going to, I have some notes and I hope it's all right with you. I'm going to bring them up. And so you'll see that I'll be reading a little bit here from my notes, but I'll try to keep it um, just as animated as I can. I'm going to talk to you about what makes a cozy so cozy. I'm going to talk to you about my journey as a doctor and a writer and then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the magic of writing. Now, Alan told me that you guys have a writing club there. Are any of you part of that writing club? Oh yeah, perfect, okay. Yes, excellent. And um, as far as cozy murder mysteries go, do any of you guys read cozies on, are you cozy fans? No, no? okay. Well, then I'm gonna introduce you to something that I think you're gonna enjoy quite a bit. So first of all, I'm gonna talk about what makes a cozy so cozy. So cozies are murder mysteries that have no violence on screen and they're character driven and there's usually an amateur sleuth. My particular series has a whole gaggle of sleuths. They usually take place in an enclosed space where all the characters are, so you know the killer's gonna be amongst them. For instance, the train in Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express, or the island in And Then There Were None, or the small English village or the country estate where the unwitting gather for a weekend. Cozies are lighthearted reads, and they're often humorous, and there's often some very gentle romance. They can involve a hobby or a craft or a specific profession, like a cookie shop owner or a bed and breakfast owner or a dog walker. And baked goods are common. And there's almost always a dog or a cat. And those are some elements of cozies that you'll see over and over again. They seem to have their heyday when the world is tumultuous and people need a gentle escape. So the golden age of mysteries with authors like Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers started after World War I, and it thrived through the Great Depression in the 1930s. I wrote my first cozy mystery a while ago, but when I tried to pitch it to the agents and editors, they would say, oh, we love cozies, but there's no market for them right now. We want noir and edgy and vampires and zombies and goth and unreliable narrators. But now the world has turned edgy and cozies are back in. And I don't know how many of you saw the movie Knives Out, but that was a cozy murder mystery. And then Kenneth Branagh is gonna go through a lot of the Agatha Christie's. He already did Murder on the Orient Express and Death on the Nile mm -hmm. was supposed to come out this past year, but it's on hold because of COVID. So that is part of the wave of cozies. So after years of trying to get my cozy published, in the end, I had two small publishers vying for the manuscript because now cozies are back. So my series, which is called The Fog Ladies, involves spunky senior sleuths and an overtired, overstressed young doctor in training who all live together in an elegant apartment building in San Francisco. The name of the Fog Ladies series and the idea for the group of ladies came to me instantly before anything else about the story. The Fog Ladies are a group who come together as their husbands die and they do good works and they forge a friendship. They're called the Fog Ladies because you can count on them like you can count on early morning fog burning off by midday in San Francisco. And years ago, I lived in an elegant apartment building just like the one in the book, minus the murders, when I did my medical training in San Francisco. And being the lifelong cozy lover that I was, I thought the building would be a perfect setting for that enclosed type cozy setting because tenants of all ages live together for years and years. They know everybody's secrets. And so it provides that perfect cast of characters who are all clumped together. In book one, Mrs. Bridge falls off a stool cleaning bugs out of her kitchen light and Mrs. Talwin slips on bubbles in the bath and drowns. The fog ladies don't believe the deaths are accidents but that means a killer is afoot and there's nowhere to hide. Now, cozies are driven by characters and this is one of the huge things about them, the characters. And um, I love all the characters in the book, but um, they each have their own personality quirks and they always grow and learn something about themselves. But I have a favorite character and that's 80 year old Enid Carmichael. And I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit about the first book in her own words. Enid Carmichael here, 
I am not a busybody and I am not a lush, as some would say. I'm an 80 year old crusader for safety in our elegant Pacific Heights apartment building where tenants are dying faster than the fog rolls in on a cool San Francisco evening. I'm a fog lady, which means my friends can count on me like the early morning fog burning off by midday. Mm. There are six of us, but when we all live together in this jinxed building, but we're not six anymore now, are we? Muriel Bridge fell off a stool, cleaning bugs out of the kitchen light. Mrs. Talwin slipped on bubbles in the bath and drowned, or so they say. Sarah, a young doctor in training in the building, thinks we're dying because we're old. What does she know? She's overworked, overtired, overstressed. Plus, she's in her 20s. She hasn't seen much of life. I might be 80, but I'm not dead yet. I have eyes, and my apartment does perch right over the front door. My hearing is sharp, much sharper than people give me credit for. There are many benefits of being old. I often see and hear things people don't intend. I saw Tommy, the handyman, with his new jewelry and his fancy new clothes. He doesn't have that kind of money, but the dead tenants did. And Tommy has keys to their apartments. And I know about Mr. Glenn. I heard him muttering about us. He doesn't like the fog ladies, not since that nasty business with Muriel Bridge, not since his wife died. He thinks we're to blame, as if we'd stopped Bessie's heart with our very own hands. Humph. Francis Noonan won't hear any bad talk about Mr. Glenn. She doesn't even believe there've been murders, that evil lurks in our building. She sees too much good in people. Or if she even considers murders, she thinks it's Big Owen and Chantrell, those ne'er-do-well teen parents she got us mixed up with, with her hospital volunteer project. Her and her good works. Well, the killer might be Big Owen, and it might be Tommy, and it might be Mr. Glenn. But whoever it is, people are dying, and someone has to watch the comings and goings of the building. Someone has to keep us safe. I have Mr. Glenn's journal. He started it when his wife was sick and he just kept writing. He left it in the laundry room and I'll get it back to him as soon as I'm done reading it. That's what I'm gonna do today. I have some coupons for those Starbucks lattes from the newspaper. I'm gonna sit and drink that lovely, bitter, frothy coffee and read Mr. Glenn's journal. <laughs> then we'll see who's right and who's wrong about our building. Then we'll see who the killer is. Mm. Now I'm gonna tell you about how the being a doctor and being a writer came to be. So I've loved writing my whole life. When I was young, I wanted to be a ballerina, a doctor, and a writer, all together, all at once. Mm -hmm. my, ballet, my ballet days ended before they began at age four with my per first performance. My curtsy took out the backdrop and it crashed it to the floor. I tried more ballet lessons in high school, but I was far too old. So all that was left was being a doctor and being a writer. The latter took me a while. Being a doctor was a straight shot. Four years of med school, three years of residency, fellowship, and then a stint in the army because they paid for medical school. Mm -hmm. And then here I am. But being a writer took longer, and I've been plotting my stories since those ballerina days. Each of the books has a medical theme. I wrote, in addition to the Kabog Ladies, I wrote a lighthearted picture book about Alzheimer's disease and dementia called Granny Can't Remember Me. And I wrote a middle grade fantasy that's actually going to come out in May called The Antidote about a family of doctors going back generations with a boy who can see disease. And then The Fog Ladies has the young doctor as the main character, but also um, the first mystery turned on a medical diagnosis. And each book has some public service announcements hidden inside. In The Antidote, the book for the middle grade students, I describe how to do a Heimlich maneuver and how to use an AED, an automated external defibrillator. And in the cozy murder mysteries, I have hidden public service announcements. Get your colonoscopy. Make sure your stairs are safe. Don't cut a bagel in your hand and don't get a jailhouse tattoo. So when did I write the books? Well, as a doctor and a mom, time was always in short supply. But as you know, in Seattle, in the summer, the sun gets up at 4.30 in the morning and it shines right in our bedroom. 
And so I would write on those early morning summer weekends before my family woke up. And so I would start writing about 4.30 and they'd get up about nine o'clock. It's much harder in the winter when I actually had to set an alarm. Uh, but my big, giant, fluffy, black, silent Newfoundland dog, Albert, would dutifully pad downstairs with me and he'd lie by my side and he was my constant writing companion. So being a doctor influenced my writing, both uh, professions, writing and doctoring, you have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And just like I listen to understand with my patients, I had to listen to my characters because some of them had different ideas about what was gonna to happen to them than I did. So that character, Enid Carmichael, discovers these Starbucks lattes when she's 80 years old. She loves the bitterness and the froth. And I wrote that and I planned that out. But then she craved more. And the next thing I knew, she was stealing Starbucks coupons from her neighbor's newspapers to feed her addiction. I never intended for her to do that. She did that completely by herself. I didn't, I didn't come up with that idea myself. So that brings us to the magical part of writing. When um, you're writing the first draft, when your fingers are flying on the keyboard, anything can happen. And that's before that dreaded second draft, when I find all the plot holes and I realize I have too few suspects or that I have a pregnancy that lasted 17 months. And that was a real problem. I had to go back and change it all. But during this fun writing of the first draft, one character wrote herself onto life support. And then she expected me to somehow revive her. Another of the ladies thought that the next best thing that was going to happen in life was when she was going to be welcomed into heaven. And I had planned her out. That's kind of her uh, um, personality. She's just kind of a... Um, kind of a stoic, but not very, not a lot of pleasure in her life. But then the fog ladies arranged a caravan of cars to take families to see their loved ones at a woman's prison on Christmas day. And some of these people hadn't seen their families for a long time. And she realizes how much good the fog ladies are doing every day. And she has this complete revelation. And she realizes that the next best thing isn't when she goes to heaven, the next best thing is right here on earth. So she had a complete transformation. And then in the third book, which comes out in October, she's a new woman and she's leading volunteer projects that she never would have thought of previously. And she even starts to color her hair. And again, this is just something that happened as I was writing. I didn't plan that out. She just kind of took over and did that. But the best magic that I had was when I was writing the first book, I had too few suspects. And then out of nowhere, a little family appeared. Chantrell, Baby Owen, and Big Owen, who are ne'er-do-well teenage parents and their little baby. The Fog ladies take in 16-year-old Chantrell and her baby as a part of a volunteer project at the hospital, but these characters were never part of the original story. They created themselves, and they provided endless humor and richness, but also a lot of sadness in the story and their characters now that recur through all three books. And that's the um, magic that happens with writing. And so I'm going to conclude this uh, bit with one of my favorite scenes. There's a romance uh, between two of the older characters in the building. And uh, Frances Noonan watches this romance bloom. And she's a widow. And she gets very sad remembering um, her husband of 40 years. And that sadness kind of permeates the whole of book two as she tries to deal with this. And then uh, this uh, uh, portion of the story comes at the very end. Mrs. Honeycutt set a small blue tin on the table and opened it. At first, Frances Noonan couldn't place the smell. Then she inhaled sharply, engulfed in memories. The scent of her husband wafted out of the tin. Maybe you'll like these, Olivia Honeycutt said to the group. Too strong for me. When did mints stop coming in rolls? Mrs. Noonan sat paralyzed. She smelled Bill in his wintergreen breath as he leaned over to kiss her cheek. She smelled Bill sitting next to her, reading on the couch, his feet touching hers. She smelled Bill at the kitchen table, working on a crossword. A cream puff was halfway to Enid Carmichael's mouth, but she dropped her hand and grabbed at the tin, knocking a few mints out onto the table. I'll try one, she said. Alma, Harriet, someone's breath was mighty fragrant in the car. Who had onions for lunch? Francis, I think it was you, here. The mint was tiny in Edith's oversized hand, tiny, but packed with reminiscences. Francis inhaled again. 
The wintergreen was overpowering. She breathed it in and her uncertainty and panic fell away, leaving her happier and happier. She reached out her hand, seized the mint and popped it in her mouth. She sucked in, savoring the intensity of the wintergreen flavor. Bill was with her and always would be. Every memory was a blessing to hold and to cherish. Maybe take two, Enid Carmichael said, shoving the whole tin closer. It's definitely your breath. Oh dear, Alma Gordon said. But Mrs. Noonan took a second mint, feeling lighter than she had in months. So that's the reading from that book. And I'd love to ask you if you have um, any questions, especially those of you who have done some writing yourself or any questions at all. Um, does anybody have a question? I love hearing about how you are building the character. And I've never really tried to write dialogue and I've just made a commitment to doing that, people speaking together. And I thought it would be really hard, but the first time I did it, it's not as hard as I thought. Uh, it's fun. It is fun. And in this book, because it's a group of ladies, some of my favorite scenes are when they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. In fact, I may have one um, here to read from the second book because um, the ladies, when they get together, can be um, quite, quite a bit of fun. And let me just see if I can't find that book. Oh, I do have it. Okay. This is really short. Any news on your killer, Mrs. Carmichael asked? Innocent until proven guilty, Francis Noonan winked at Sarah. Lambs are innocent. This man is not, Harriet Flynn said. It's the breakup of the family. No family values, no respect. What's society coming to? Sarah couldn't stand it any longer, this flippant chit chat about another man's life. She blurted out, Mrs. Noonan knows his family. They're good people with values. The woman turned to Mrs. Noonan and Sarah was relieved to see her thoughtful expression as she stroked camouflage's fur. Finally, she addressed them. Ladies, Sarah's right. I know this man's mother and his grandparents. They're as honorable as they come. There may be more to this than money and passion and a dead end job and a wife with a rising career, said Mrs. Carmichael. Just a sin, said Hello. Mrs. Finn. And the loss of man manifest by his wife's lack of respect in his unusual choice of exercise, said Mrs. Honeycutt. Vanity, a sin, said Mrs. Flynn. Ladies, ladies, please, said Mrs. Noonan. This is not just some man we're reading about in the newspaper. Sarah met him. She got a feeling about him. He knew his family. I think we should offer our support. If nothing else, we can be a comfort to his mother. But there may be more to this killing than a desperate husband. Oh, I hope so, said Mrs. Carmichael gleefully. When do we get to meet the killer? So that's a bit of dialogue and you're right. The dialogue can be very fun to write. Does anybody have any other questions? When you think about cozies like this, um, now that you kind of hear what they are, can people think of cozies that they've seen um, or read like Columbo. I don't know if you remember Columbo from all those years ago, but Columbo was definitely a cozy. It was a little bit of a flipped cozy because you always knew who did it in the beginning, but it was always that small circle of people, very gentle, no violence on screen. He had a dog. He had a basset hound who I think his name was Dog, if I'm remembering correctly, but those were cozies. And of course, Murder, She Wrote could be some of the most famous uh, television cozies of all. Um, do other people, can you think of cozies that you've seen on uh, television or in the movies or books? Do you know Leslie Butterwitz by chance? No. She writes from Montana. She has, she has a boxes full of cozies. I think she does very well. So that is one thing when you start a cozy series, oftentimes there get to be many, many, many books. Like, does anybody read um, Alexander McCaw Smith, the number one ladies detective agent? <laughs> so those are cozies. And I think there may be 26 books, maybe 28 books. There's a lot of those books. He's very prolific. And that's an example of a cozy. Usually cozies have an amateur sleuth and then usually the boyfriend or the cousin is some kind of a professional that can help um, give them some uh, knowledge if they need knowledge. There's usually some qualified professional amongst the friend circle, but that's an example of the actual, um, and Columbo as well, the actual um, main character being a, a detective, a sleuth. Do you use a medical mystery as part of your plot? Yeah, so the first book 
the diagnosis turns on a medical mystery. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. And I have a lot of fun um, putting in the medicine into the books. And as the books go along, you know, maybe there's a little less medicine, a little bit less medicine, but I always try to hide those little, um, they call them Easter eggs, uh, those little fun things that you can hide in there. Like for instance, the thing about the cutting the bagel in your hand, um, this is in book two, uh, one of the women, um, her son is the supposed killer and he's got a little boy who's uh, three years old. And so when they arrest him for killing his wife, so there's no mom, now the dad's arrested, uh, the son, they what, the, what are they gonna do with the son? So they have to find the grandma. But she uh, turns out that that day she cut a bagel in her hand and she has to go to the emergency department where she spends most of the night. And so the poor little boy has to go to protective services um, overnight and then she gets him the next day. But it turns out, and so, so this is something I'm very passionate about, cutting a bagel in your hand. Uh, it turns out that if you cut a bagel in your hand, um, there are so many important uh, tendons in your hand that the injury can be far more dangerous than you would ever imagine. And it oftentimes takes a hand surgeon to help you if you've uh, gotten an injury cutting a bagel on your hand. So I put that in the book. And then I'm a gastroenterologist and of course believe in colonoscopies. And so I put that in the book. One of the, um, one of the women, um, the, the Mr. Glenn's wife died of colon cancer. And so then I have the ladies discussing getting their colonoscopies. So I have that in the book too. So I do have these. And then the jailhouse tattoo, they, one of the lady killers that they get to go visit to um, interrogate is in a women's prison in California. And uh, when they go there, they go on the guise of bringing a quilting project to the women incarcerates. And so they have to meet a lot of ladies in the jail. And um, one of them has a tattoo. And uh, so she says, you know, we all gave ourselves tattoos. We all gave each other tattoos and we got the tattoo and we got hepatitis C. So that's my, my, um, my other little, you know, public service <laughs> announcement. So they're, they're kind of riddled in there, these, uh, these little medical things. And the book that's coming out in May, which is a middle grade book, but can be read by fantasy readers of all ages, it's completely medical. The whole thing is medical about a boy who can see disease. And so the idea behind that book is to have um, kids know a lot about the body and health and disease. And in fact, infectious disease figures huge in it. So it's not about COVID, but it's a perfect time for the book to come out because it talks about all the infectious diseases of the past like plague and Spanish flu and measles and how through science we've conquered them. So that's um, all medical. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? Now, Shirley, you're part of the writer's group. What do you guys do in the writer's group? have an assigned topic from week to week and then we also do 10 minutes of writing on another topic that's been given to us but we haven't met much we've only started meeting again in the garage um, which is better than not at all but not anything like it used to be sure sure yeah Has and any I don't know I don't know who does the topics um Boislin do you know Boislin's also in the, oh, in the yeah. group and, and some, I don't know, there's a list of topics. I'm the last person to join, but um, they decide which one they're going to do for the following week. You know, these writing prompts can be quite fun. I've um, done these at different conferences. They give you a writing prompt in 10 minutes, 15 minutes or something to write them. And then you think afterwards, gosh, this is so good. Where can I use this? And then darned if they don't appear somewhere, you know, all strung together in, um, in a book somewhere. And so if you keep them all, they may all appear someplace sometime. What do you think? <laughs> So what? how long how long does it take you to write a book? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, the book isn't done until the um, editor and the publisher drag it out of your hand saying, this is the last time. You won't believe it, but there are like 10 drafts. So the first draft, me, most fun, absolutely fun. You just put it all down there. It doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense. It's just all fun and all this magic happens. And then you have to go back and read it. And you realize that... Um, you have to take perfectly innocent characters and turn them into suspects, or you forgot that um, this woman uh, loves horoscopes and you have to go back and put horoscopes in everywhere. 
And so that second draft is no fun. And then come even the more tedious drafts where you have to make sure you don't use too many adverbs and you have to make sure that it's all an active voice. You know, each of these is a draft amongst itself. And so those are horrific drafts and where to put the commas. I, you know, ugh, me and commas. And so draft after draft after draft. But the first book, because you know, I shopped it around for so long to agents and editors, and each time they would come back to me with good advice. Like, for instance, Enid Carmichael, my favorite character, I had killed her off in the first book. At the end of the book, I'd killed her off. And then, um, so when you're writing these and you send it to agent, agents and editors in the beginning, you would just get back. And so in the, I did it in the days of paper in the beginning. So you'd get back a letter and it would get your, your, your letter. You'd get your letter back to them and just say no at the top in red. <laughs> you get it back and it says no. And then it come back. Uh, you're getting a little better at this and it comes back. No, don't like cats. Okay. Something like that. And then you start to get actual letters back and they say, well, I really liked it, but we don't have a place for a cozy mystery, but I would, I would recommend that you do this, this, and this. And so once I got a two page single space letter from an editor, you know, saying how to improve it, but multiple, multiple people said, don't kill off Enid Carmichael. And so I didn't kill her off. And that's how I had to get her off life supports. But she does get off life support and she lives in book two and book three and she's by far and away my favorite character and she would have been dead if I had had that book published before I changed it. So the first book, book number one, because I had shopped it around for so long, it got changed multiple, multiple times and I would say that that book could have uh, probably took five to 10 years to write and publish. Then once you have your first book published, then it gets much easier because now someone is wants the second book. And so then the second book took about 18 months. And now this third book that's coming out in October took all of like eight months. And that's from some no idea, trying to come up with the idea all the way through to done with the editor, final copy, the whole business. And so, um, so it gets a lot faster. Now, the other thing that happened, of course, was I retired. So I used to be a doctor and write only on the weekends and only for a set number of time in the morning. But now I can write whatever I want. And my kids got older. You know, you guys probably remember when you finally got those children out of the house, how much more free time you had. I still have a kid at home, but he's an easy kid. And so it feels like I have so much free time. And so that's another reason why the third book went so fast was because I can write it whenever I want. So that was very helpful. Do you use much dialect when you're doing dialogue? So Steve, I have not used dialect because um, I don't care for it when I read it. I find it hard to read. And so I didn't put it in when I write, but there's no question that every person has their own way of speaking. Like for instance, there's a policeman one of the women's husbands used to be a policeman, he died, but um, she knows a young man on the force because of that. And so this policeman comes to talk to the ladies and um, tell them, of course, that these deaths were natural, that they'd been to the medical examiner, they'd had autopsies, that sort of thing. But the policeman has a very stilted way of speaking. And then um, Enid Carmichael, she has no filter. And so she just, you know, her discussions are just all out there. And then um, one of the ladies is quite buttoned up and then her dis her um, speech is different. So I don't have dialect, but each of the people has their own distinct manner of speaking. And how much diversity is there in your, cat, in your characters? So that's also an excellent question and a little bit of a difficult topic and I'll tell you why. So, um, the fog ladies are all uh, Caucasian, but they're from all kinds of different backgrounds. And um, there's dogs and cats, they're of all breeds. Uh, there um, is in this third book, there is a very um, uh, beautiful, elegant, smart black woman who goes on to be the face of children's science museums across the nation. She's a model and she's going to be the public face of children's science museums. Um, and so she is the only um, diverse character in the Fog Ladies saga. In The Antidote, the middle grade book, um, you know, my kid's life is full of all people. And so in the book, I put all people and it's got a wide cast of characters of all um, shapes, sizes, colors, everything. But as a writer, a white 
uh, woman writer, I have to be careful because I do not want to misappropriate and um, speak for anybody else and get it wrong. Um, and so uh, I have these characters, but I have to make sure that there's no stereotypes in there and that um, you know something a little unexpected happens if I'm putting in a character who doesn't look like me. And so, um, so the antidote is extremely diverse, uh, just like, you know, looks like Seattle. Um, well, Seattle's not that diverse, looks like, let's say, Washington, DC. Um, and, but I did have to think long and hard as I was creating each of those characters to make sure I wasn't creating a stereotype from my own biases. Mm -hmm. Do you ask that question for a specific reason? No, I, I know there's been some c concern about uh, people of some ethnic backgrounds trying to write in a voice of another background. And That's what we're speaking about, yeah. And, yeah. You know, so I did have to be careful. Now, I'm not a little old lady, and um, so I am writing in, in that voice, but um, I uh, have to say I have so much, um, I've always loved um, older women and the wisdom and the life um, uh, experience. And so, um, you know, am I misappropriating? I don't know, but I'm trying not to. Mm -hmm. You ladies, if you ever le read the book, you can tell me if I've got things wrong. I've tried to be a good student as a doctor and as a daughter, um, my, my mom, when she was at uh, Exeter House, which was directly across the street from Virginia Mason, which meant that every single night I could have dinner with her. And so I get there at the tail end of the dinner. And this was of course in the days when we got to sit around the dinner table. So I get there at the tail end um, of dinner every night and it was just a lovely experience. I'm interested in the way these characters take over um, when you probably surprised sometimes. Do you ever, just sort of wipe them out because you decide as you go along, no, this just isn't going to work? So that is an excellent question. So when you're a writer, and um, Shirley and Voicelin maybe know this, there are two types of writers, and they call them pantsers and plotters. So one type has everything all written out, or at least in their head. It doesn't have to be on paper, but an outline. I know exactly where I'm starting. I know where I'm going to end. I know what scenes I'm planning in the middle. And so there's that. And then there are people that just kind of write and uh, see what happens. And definitely for my first book, that's what I did. And it was so wonderful because all these things happen. But that's how I got to the end of that first book. And I had like two suspects and I had to go back and turn innocent people into suspects and create the little family to make another group of suspects. And so I, with my second book, I said, okay, I'm gonna plan this out. So I had more scenes and it went much smoother. So the third book, with the one that's coming out in October, I had it all planned out. I had it written down. Here's how the scenes are gonna work. And when you write um, a cozy and probably when you write suspense and when you write mystery and when you write a lot of things, there's, there's, general rules, you know, you go along a body on the first page and, you know, usually I follow something like that. And then, um, you know, you have something bad that happens in the middle of act one and then act one ends on a climax and then the tension gets more and more. And then you have something really bad that happens in the middle of act two and then it ends in this horrible place and then everything kind of resolves. And so um, I had it all written down. And then darned if this character popped out of nowhere and uh, the, the story takes place in a soup kitchen. She was a volunteer in the soup kitchen. And she just, again, just like it can happen, creates herself, writes this whole big backstory for herself. And the next thing you know, someone's dead. And it wasn't time yet for, for someone to be dead. And so um, it, that was supposed to happen like 20,000 words later. And so I actually went back and wrote her out. I redid it. I wrote her out. I redid it according to how the um, outline in my head was. And um, I took her apart and I took parts of her and gave her to other people, but she's gone. So yes, and she'll probably haunt me forever. Maybe she'll turn up in book four. I don't know. But that's the first time I've ever not gone with what a character wanted to do because this person could not die that soon because I had a lot more that I had to put in there before the person died. And so, um, so that's the first time I did that. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask about outlines because sometimes I feel like I need to round up my thoughts and 
put them down to be disciplined. But in that case, then it seems like your characters would be packed in and they couldn't take off and, and evolve the way you say. And that's the wonderful part of it. So there's kind of a fine balance between making a making an outline and letting it letting it flow. You are exactly right. And you will hear people on both sides of the seas when you go to writing conferences. They're huge um, lectures just given on this very talk. And some people have index cards all pre-planned ahead of time. And on the index cards, exactly what's going to happen in each of those scenes. And it just goes, and then they just sit down and write it. That's very easy to write like that. But I agree with you that you have lost, for me personally, I have lost that, mm, that fun part of it. I mean, all these scenes that are now my favorite scenes, they wouldn't have happened if I hadn't just been writing like that. And so the way I've done it, and I'll tell you how I've heard some other people, but what I do is I have the general idea at the start, the general idea at the end, I always know who did it. And now I have planned out, you know, who are the suspects? What are the red herrings? Everyone has to have a plausible reason and they're hiding something, a secret, you know, why they don't want their whereabouts or whatever to be known about what they were actually doing at the time of the murder. And so um, I have that planned out. But, um, but I don't have it to, um, I don't even write it down on paper. It's just, it's just in my head. And so I do let that happen. And then darned if you know, what happened was this thing that she took off and the person's dead and it wasn't time yet. And so, um, so, so that uh, you have to make a decision. Are you just going to go with it or not? And I agonized for like two or three days. I like this character. What am I going to do with her? And but I just ended up getting rid of her. But I have heard of other people who they know the start, they know the finish, they know in general where they're going, but they then they just write free form till they get to the halfway point. And then they go back and they see how far off track they got. And then they decide, are they going to rein it in or has the book gone in another direction? And I know somebody, she's a writer here in Seattle, who she actually doesn't know who the killer is when she starts. So that's kind of unusual. But she just writes and see who maybe would be the, the most likely killer. So, um, so there's all kinds of ways to do it, but it is much, much having done it now, this will be my third one that comes out in October. And so that's not like 26, like some people have, but each one has gotten significantly better. And the reason it got better was because I had more in my head about the red herrings because to go back and put a red herring in and then sometimes you have to change around the time that things happened and you have to remember um, that this hasn't happened yet. And so to be able to write it in a forward direction rather than to put things in backwards is so much easier and so much less time consuming. Now that um, brings me to another thought, this, the woman who doesn't know who the killer is. Did anybody see this um, show on the BBC? I think it was called Broad Church. Did anybody, this was a couple of years ago, okay, Broad Church. And so this was um, a different way to make a television series, uh, one of those BBC things, maybe 10 episodes, each one devoted to a character. In the beginning, you know, you've got a boy who I, I don't know if you know he's dead yet, but he's definitely missing. And um, it turns out he is dead. And then we'd see everything happen from each character's point of view along the way. And then we find out at the end who did it. And it's a surprise. Well, it turns out it was not just a surprise to us, the audience. It was a complete surprise to the character because um, for the actors, they, they didn't know who did it until the very end when they were then... Um, uh, told you're the killer, you're not the killer. And so as they're playing their parts in nine episodes or eight episodes until we get toward the end, they didn't know they were the killer. And I actually think that in Broadchurch, that was a downfall because the person who ends up being the killer is quite a sympathetic character. And in no way can you envision him being the killer. And so um, I think if the actor had known he was the killer from the beginning, he might have played a few things differently. But that's that's another way to go is nobody knows who the killer is, not even the killer. So that's another way to do it. Uh, well. And that broad church, that's a little bit of a cozy too. You know, it's set in a tiny little town mm -hmm. and um, the killer's definitely going to be part of this tiny little town. That's the other thing that's just kind of a funny cozy thing. Um, they have... Um, uh, in a cozy like where Agatha Christie's Miss Marple lived in this tiny little village in um, in England in a murder she wrote I think her town is called Cabot Cove I think it's this tiny little town but you know every time there's a murder and so um, so the town's got like 
so 300 murders a, a year. So it's, it's far too many murders. And so it's just, it's one of those funny things about cozies is there do tend to be a lot of murders in these tiny places. And so when you're thinking of your characters at the very beginning of your series, you have to think about where can we branch out? And so sometimes the person's profession can take them to a book conference like uh, or a library conference someplace else say, and then the murder can happen there. So we don't have to have all the murders happen in our tiny little town here. Cause it'd be like, as if you guys, you are perfect. You are a perfect um, setting for murder mystery, perfect setting for murder mystery. And so it would be as if in your um, community there, every week someone knew was dead and the killer was one of you guys. So there you have it. That's how some of the cozies are. <laughs> That's true of the Father Brown stories. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. <laughs> some are murderers. Midsummer murders and the midsummer murders, all kinds of murders. Yeah, and you know the guy who wrote—I um, don't know if he wrote them all, but he wrote a lot of them. Anthony Horowitz. No. He now writes cozies, and again, I think it's because cozies are back in. So he used to write, um, oh, this thing for kids called—it's um, uh, uh, a spy thing. Um, Alex Ryder, the spy series for kids. He wrote a couple of the James Bond things. He got permission from the the. Uh, uh, Fleming estate and he wrote a, a James Bond sequel. He wrote Foil's War, which was excellent. But now Anthony Horowitz writes cozies. And so there you have it, cozies are in. Just gave my granddaughter one of his books. Yeah, which one did you give her? Um, I, Murder is the Word. Yeah, those are very fun. Yeah, there's a, two or three in that series. His original one magpie murders which i read after reading him otherwise uh, i didn't think was nearly as good i so that's interesting that's a cozy and not only that it's a cozy within a cozy i had a cozy yeah and then now there's a second one i just finished it moonflower murders and it also is a cozy within a cozy so he kept to his theme there oh okay right so it's the same characters uh, same same lady sleuth, the same book publishing lady sleuth. But I do enjoy those other ones. So in this is an interesting twist. I've actually not seen this before. In the one that she's speaking of, death is the, the sentence is death. The word is murder. Yeah, the, those next the, things the, have to be about a paragraph, I guess. Um, but the word the word is murder. The sentence is death. So not something about a paragraph will be next. But he is the main character. He Anthony Horowitz, the writer is the main character of that cozy series. It's a hoot, it's a hoot. Yeah, they're, I think they're really fun. They are very fun, very fun. Sometimes when you pick up a murder mystery, you feel like it's written uh, to be dramatized. Yeah. And you know, it's like, there, it's sort of a prequel to being uh, either turned into a play or a, or a uh, movie. Have you ever had that temptation or that thought as you're working up these scenes? Well, all I can say is that I think the world is ready for a gaggle of old lady sleuths. I do. <laughs> and um, I would like for Julia Childs, if she weren't dead, to play, um, and if she were an actress, to play <laughs> Enid Carmichael because they're both tall. Enid Carmichael's a redhead, um, but she dyes her hair. So it probably used to be brown like Julia Childs. They both have the same kind of verve and um, and uh, energy. And so that's who I have in mind for my um, my actress for one of the characters. Uh, but no, I have never thought that, except to say that again, there are not a tremendous number of uh, movies or television shows involving ladies like mine. You know, there are more there are more older actresses who are playing roles of older women, like uh, um, Hillbilly Elegy with Glenn Close and sure. uh, Julia and Julia, uh, the old you know, woman who played Julia Child. So that I mean, there there are actresses out there who are certainly capable of doing that. You are exactly right. We just need someone else to see it how I see it. Yeah. an agent yeah wouldn't that be nice <laughs> and that's actually something else for people who might be um, writers so there's agents and editors but you know the world of publishing has changed so much since I started doing this so there's a group here in Seattle um, called the Pacific Northwest Writers Association and they put on an excellent conference every year and I've been going to the conference for a long time. And in the beginning, you'd go to the conference and there would be like 16 to 20 uh, publishers, editors sitting up there from, the, from publishing companies. And then there'd be 10. 
And now, of course, as you know, there's only five big publishers. They've all merged or disbanded. And so there's only five, they call them the big five, five publishers now, and that is it. And in their place have come um, self-publishing, that's a possibility, but a whole slew of small presses, which you don't need an agent for a small press. And um, that's what my, um, my publisher is a small press. And um, they're very personable. My press started out years and years ago with romance and then they branched into um, murder. And they have, I think, a hundred of us mystery writers. So they have quite a bit. And now they're branching out um, into everything. And so my middle grade fantasy is actually with the same publisher. And so they have middle grade and YA and the whole business. But they started with romance 20 years ago or more. But the publishing world has changed so much that um, you don't necessarily need to be big five. It's almost impossible to be one of those big five now, um, but you don't even necessarily need an agent any longer. So it's amazing. In case you're an aspiring writer. Could you tell us a little bit about how you publicize your books besides talking to us? Yeah, super hard. So that is the downside to not being one of the big five. But um, so there's this group uh, called the Authors Guild that I'm also part of. And it's writers of all ilks, people who are self-published um, on Amazon to incredibly um, best-selling big five um, novelists. And um, so if you are a name, you will get a publicity budget and a publicist from uh, the big five. If your book comes under contract with one of those big uh, publishing publishing houses in New York, but you're not a big name, you don't necessarily get publicity. And so it's so different now. In, in the Authors Guild, they have a, an author's chat and somebody will say, I was published 10 years ago and I was feted around the country. You know, I used to go to these things like at Elliott Bay Bookstore, you guys probably did too, where the, the writer would come and they'd be writers of all kinds, you know, could have been a first book, all kinds of different things. But now the only people who get sent around the country are, are huge names like Anthony Horowitz, for instance. Um, and so this, this in the Authors Guild, people say, you know, 10 years ago, I had a book come out with a big five publisher and I was sent around the country and I had this huge wonderful um, uh, book tour. And now I have the same publisher, but they're not doing anything for me. And that is uh, extremely common. And so it's left to, to us to do it. And so um, for me personally, um, there are a couple of different ways. Uh, there are um, a lot of uh, cozy murder mystery groups like either book groups or um, uh, Facebook has a lot of cozy um, books. So you can advertise that way to, to groups that are specifically cozy murder mystery readers. And that is where the bulk of my readers are gonna come. We write blogs. And so like a guest post for a blog, I'm doing one right now about how even though the weather is changing, um, this cozy feeling, which they call, what is it? I can't even pronounce it, but higi, I think, you know, this wonderful feeling of being by the fire with your murder mystery and your cocoa, that we can take that into the spring. So I'm writing that blog now and taking photos of coziness that comes from springtime. Uh, but we then you, you have blo these blog tours and you write a guest post blog and it goes on a murder mystery, a cozy murder mystery um, blog site where followers of cozy murder mysteries um, read these and then, you know, uh, that's a way to get publicity. It's, it's those kinds of things that are done. And um, both all my books that have come out, except for the one that came out during COVID, have had readings at third place books, which was loads of fun. Um, but, uh, you know, just at third place books, not at the other bookstores, for instance. So it's, it, that is by far and away the hardest part. And you will speak to some writers who say they spend 50% of their time on uh, writing and 50% of their time on publicity. So for instance, I, before this, I didn't have a Facebook account. I didn't have an Instagram account. I didn't have a Twitter account. And now I have all three. And that is solely because of the idea of marketing and publicity which was nowhere on my horizon when I started this. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Well, this has been just tremendously fun. And I thank you guys for um, coming and I'm happy to talk to you and 
gosh, I'm excited about tomorrow for your dining room. That is a huge day, a huge day. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. Thank you very much. You're very, very welcome. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you so much. And now maybe you'll be a cozy, a cozy aficionado like, like I am. <laughs> Thanks so much, Thanks. Susan. We really appreciate it. And this will be recorded. So if your friends miss this, let them know. I'll get the recording up soon. Thanks for everything. It's been a wonderful program. Thank you to all of you and good luck tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.